Hello from a sunny Amsterdam. Thank you all for joining the live stream today. So today we have Omar Tomasoni, principal trumpet with the Concertgebouw Orchest. I'm Martin Schippers, trombonist with the Concertgebouw Orchest. And we are live on YouTube and Facebook at the same time. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to post them here uh, in, the, in the comment section. Um, I think Omar Tomasoni doesn't need much of an introduction besides just letting him play. I remember a very nice concert that he played with uh, Maestro Janssons in uh, the piano concerto of Shostakovich. So as a small introduction I will play this. Yeah, beautiful. As I said, we don't need much more of an introduction than to just let him play. So he's connected now. Let's switch to Omar. In the meantime, let us know from where you're all watching. It's always nice to see from where in the planet everybody's watching. First of all, I hope you're all healthy and safe. And um, well, let us may be back as soon as possible in the concert hall as a movie we just saw. So let's see if Omar is there. Oh my. Hey Martin! <laughs> How are you? I'm good man, how are you? I'm good, I'm good actually, yeah. I mean, what can we say? Wait one second here. I wish we would be back on stage, the one I just showed, but... Yeah, we are all hoping for that, of course. I guess it's gonna take some while. How have you been doing? Oh, uh, some things at home, but first of all, being with my son. Uh, oh yeah, of course. Is it so? And uh, spending time with him, uh, being at home, and practicing, cooking, fixing some stuff that uh, I had to fix <laughs> in the house since uh, months. So, yeah, these kind of things, you know. So you actually practice? I did practice. <laughs> yeah. I try to. I try to practice every day. Like, uh, you know, at least two hours, two, two hours, two hours. I, I, you know, I finally have the time to go back to my my really beginning, you know, to, to do the uh, all the exercise I was doing when I was a kid. So very basic, you know, all the uh, taking care of uh, small details and working, uh, you know, in all the things I was doing before and and now I still have the time to do it. I, I have finally have the time to do, sorry. So I'm actually enjoying very much. That's nice. I mean, I think if there's one trumpet player in the world that doesn't need motivation to practice, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, oh. you, I mean, like, let's be honest, you practice like, you like practicing, right? I love to practice very much. That's I nice. mostly, you know, sometimes I enjoy more 
the the practicing to be alone with my instrument that uh, to that to do a concert sometimes you know yeah, yeah, this, yeah. this this process this building up and this uh, look for uh, yeah details and that that is it really makes me very happy it's like you know if you there is a chemical or or these people that uh, study with a microscope and stuff in laboratory you know and they are just very happy when they do a discover you know and this, I, I have this kind of you know feeling you know i find it very hard like i spoke to a lot of colleagues and friends and musicians like of course we are already when when did we play the last concert i think we played it together no was uh, yeah it was this tchaikovsky Tcha- six tchaikovsky uh, six i mean it's already more than five half of May, you know? half more than of May. five more than five weeks ago. No, it was like in March. March. Oh, March. Sorry, in May. <laughs> May yes. We're in April. <laughs> <laughs> it was March. Yeah, you're right. It's like five weeks ago. But um, for me, the last, especially the last week, it has been hard to keep up the motivation to practice, man. So please give me some of your energy. <laughs> That's nice. So can, can, can you... I mean, I think everybody knows, but can you explain a little bit your musical path? Because I remember we spoke about it many times, but you were all, you were very young when you got your first job, no, in Italy. Yeah, I was very young when I started to work in the orchestra. Well, my 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 job job was uh, I was 18 years old and I started in uh, in Florence in Maggio Musicale Fiorentino. I have been playing in the orchestra as a second trumpet before that, so when I was 16 years old, actually. Uh, not regularly, but I was uh, re- playing some weeks in Parma, at Teatro Reggio di Parma. And, uh, and then I, I did uh, this um, um, Maggio Musicale Fiorentino, of course, for five years until I was 23. And then I moved to Santa Cecilia in Rome for five years until 28. And then I finally came to Concert Gebau when I was 28 years old. And how long are you with, with us now, with Concert Gebau Orchest? Uh, since 2013. Oh, wow. Seven, seven years old, yeah. It's time. already a long time, yeah. Time flies, wow. And, and, but you were born in the north of Italy, right? I was born in Roccafranca, this very little village uh, uh, near Brescia. So it's uh, 3,500 or 4,000 people. You know, it's a very, very small village. Unfortunately, it was in the middle of all this very bad. Uh, yeah, I was I was going to ask, like, how is the, like, is it, how is the situation? Your family is okay? Like, because it was one of the hardest hit areas, no? Yes, is, is. yes. It is unfortunately still going on, and uh, this looks like it's getting more stable. But uh, yeah, I mean there are still too many people that doesn't make it, you know. And uh, we, my family is quite is okay. Unfortunately, there is uh, my sister, mother-in-law. She's a bit sick, so hopefully she will recover. And uh, we are, uh, yeah, hoping that everything is going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. Remember, actually, a week before everything started, we played a concert in Verona with the Brass Ensemble. Yes, absolutely. I do remember. And uh, for me, it was a fantastic moment of my career and also my I, life. I think, it was, it, I think it was the first time that we played with the Brass Ensemble in, in, in Italy. I think so, right? I think that's been once before because I asked to uh, to the colleague. Uh, they played once before in Bolzen, in Bolzano or Trento, something like that, many years ago. But then, then we did this Verona Verona concert, and for me it was really special because I I managed, I, I had the, the the privilege and the the honor to to go there with all of you guys, and uh, you know. So it was like a dream came come true, you know. So no, it was and incredible. Luckily, and luckily, we, it happened that it was the last week, or or or, or just like the week after that they closed everything. I know. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Luckily, we managed to do that, man. Yeah, I mean, beautiful theater there in Verona. Very good. That's a theater story. Very beautiful. Yeah. So I got some uh, reaction from, I think, a lot of people. 
Like they're watching from everywhere. Also, yeah, a lot by the way, I say hi to everyone and thank you for uh, watching, of course. Yeah. No, we have a few hundreds of people on YouTube and Facebook. It's great. And people are watching from all over the place. Mm. Ah, also from Roca Franca, actually. <laughs> uh, who is my sister? <laughs> no, Domenico Brancati. Oh, Domenico. <laughs> nice. Actually, many, many people from Italy, Lithuania, Japan, Colombia, UK, USA, Taiwan, Canada, Cyprus. A lot of people from Thailand also I see, Argentina, Bulgaria, uh, of course a lot of people from the Netherlands, nice. So again to repeat, if anybody has any question feel free to post it in the comment section. At the end of the interview we will, we will answer, uh, answer some questions. So Omar, you were speaking about um, your practicing at this moment and that you like to work on some things. So, in terms of your daily routine, do you follow a certain schedule in terms of exercises that you do or do you let it depend on, on your shape or the program that's coming up or, or the inst type of instrument you have to play? Because, of course, as a trumpet player, you also switch a lot between different instruments. Does it affect your, your daily routine? Uh, yes. I do well, well. What I'm doing now, especially now, because as I said before, I have time and I don't have a uh, concert to perform. I'm really focusing on the basics. So I'm I, I, I'm back to do really the very 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 simple stuff. So um, and of course um, there is one one thing that I'm actually experimenting now because lately I was practicing a lot with a mouthpiece but I realized that I was uh, I don't know why probably I was not doing it well it, it made me be very it was you know my I'm sure after that was not was very hard you know after the 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, mouthpiece practice in the beginning I was always starting with mouthpiece and now I stopped to do that and I just start with an instrument and I have to say that I feel uh, much better with my embouchure, and I switch to mouthpiece after while I'm while I'm uh, while I'm uh, I find some passages that doesn't come, so I switch to mouthpiece. But it's it's interesting topic mouthpiece buzzing because obviously there are many opinions about this. Some people Absolutely. some people say like no mouthpiece buzzing is bad. Some say it's like it's the holy grail. Some like. Of course, mouthpiece buzzing is never the same as playing the instrument, right? Because you miss the the vibration coming back, like the the waves of the sound. But so, like, you notice that when you play too much mouthpiece, it started to work against you. So now you're looking for a better balance. But but what do you think about mouthpiece buzzing in general? Yeah, there's the thing. Uh, well, the, first of all, I think that everyone is different. So. Everybody has to find his own way, you know, they, they have to find their own way. So what can work for me probably doesn't work for you or, you know, so everyone has to experiment. As, I'm, as, I'm, as I said, I was doing a lot of mouthpiece, so I'm actually not against it at all. And, and then, but, but doing a lot of mouthpiece, you mean in combination with the instrument or only mouthpiece? I was just doing the, the, my my uh, begin my first 10 minutes, 15 minutes a, a day of a day and any days was like only with mouthpiece. Okay. I was doing like with a piano. I was doing some chords and then I was doing you know like a mouthpiece playing. But then I, I realized that probably I was not doing it well. I can, I can also be. I realized that I was getting very hard here. You know, so I, I was losing a bit of flexibility. Mm -hmm. And the sound were getting a bit more narrow. So now I'm just trying to start with a trumpet, like I just play, you know, I do some very simple exercise. And then later on, if I find something that uh, doesn't come as I like, then I also try to uh, to play like for a few seconds or for a minute with a mouthpiece. Oh, that's interesting. Like I also find it. I have exactly the same experience with mouthpiece buzzing actually. Like if you only do mouthpiece without combining it with the instrument, it, it becomes like almost too yep. much, you know, because it's very intense in a way. So also the way you say it, like 
it's a very useful tool in order to s micromanage the intonation of your vibration, right? Yes, correct. And that's yeah, nice. Um, I mean, what would you say is, are the biggest benefits of, of, of practicing the mouthpiece in combination with the trumpet then? But you know, the, the biggest benefit is that you can uh, really realize what is not what is not happening. So as as more as simple as you make your as simple as you re, you, you make your playing, as you know taking the instrument away is like that you take a problem away psychologically. Yeah. Also. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can you can really go back to to the nature. You know, it's also for example for me uh, more even more important than the the then the mouthpiece is the singing part. So this really, sometimes we don't put enough focus and in, uh, we don't give enough importance to this uh, part, but it is, for me it's actually probably the, the, the mainly, the mainly, you know, the most important thing, you know, yeah. playing, especially for our instrument, that we don't have an octave, you know, and the, so we need to create also, you know, that. So it's actually when I have trouble, when I have some problem, I really I start to sing, you know, first, and then I put my mouthpiece there to see if I'm blowing. You know, for me, mouthpiece is like, it's just to, it's just a check, you know, to see if the, there is a vibration, of course. But if I really blow, if there is a moment, there is a passage, there is something that's really, you know, interrupt the air or something, you know. And and just to to elaborate a bit on the on the singing part it's it's um what do you notice that happens when you actually forget to sing first like your focus changes more to the technical side instead of making absolutely. it as natural yes. as possible absolutely yes and this is something that happened to me a lot when i'm nervous so uh, I'm for when i get nervous i start to uh, stop thinking and, and and then I I of course I get less free you know also in my way of playing and I start to focus a lot in what I'm supposed to do instead yeah. of just have a goal in your head and just go for it you know yeah. and uh, when you start to focus in what you have to do I, I notice that I get much more tired you know because you try to control everything so and for sure you 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 blow less you know like your your flowing your airflow uh, you get influence from that for sure you know so so basically you you want to have as little as possible thoughts between what you hear uh, i mean what you sing and what you hear f back from the trumpet absolutely, absolutely and and for me it's difficult actually to when I practice here in my, I mean, I have a nice studio, but of course it's not concertgebouw. <laughs> I mean, nothing is concertgebouw in the end. For me, I don't know for you, but I think there is no better hall in the world than concertgebouw. But how how do you manage uh, to 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 keep focusing on 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 your sound while you don't have the acoustics of a nice of a nice hall? I I think that's is also it? also for students often a problem because. They have to sometimes practice a lot in small rooms, no? And yeah, and this is a very good question. It's difficult to get a reference. Absolutely, you are absolutely right. And I was actually thinking about this few days ago. I was also talking with Femke about that uh, because I was used to play in a very boomy um, spaces, and I actually was choosing booming spaces. Because for me, it was a way to listen myself constantly, like. I was just playing and listening what was coming back because you know you have this kind of uh, echo and in sometimes in Rome where I was there in this auditorium there was these huge corridors and these big rooms in the basement so I was very lucky I was spending there the whole day just playing and playing and uh, now that I also don't have a possibility to play in uh, such acoustic I also play into uh, dry rooms but uh, yeah, that's the I miss this this part and this feeling that you can just listen your sound, you know, you can judge yourself constantly, and this is also something I think that this is also not uh, um, that's also why I focus a lot in what is happening here actually because I miss um, I miss the acoustic as you said actually, you know, 
this is a very a very important question I think you made because I know many many people suggest to students and to to many players to practice into dry spaces because of course it's true they don't forgive yeah it's true they don't forgive you much so if you sound good there you probably will sound good in the in the big spaces in the good acoustics but in the other end I have to say if you get used to that kind of sound it's also difficult to go into big into big spaces and the nice acoustic and create create this very beautiful warm round and full of harmonic sound so if you have a chance if someone has a possibility to practice into boomy spaces i really suggest to do it if not every day but to please do it as much as you can you know you so, know. so to really look for the i mean if you have the pos possibility to look for the combination obviously this would be the best <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't know about you but sometimes i'm practicing here and i'm like man this sounds like not how I want. And then I come to a concert and suddenly everything sounds great. You know? <laughs> That's There's something. also something nice that you get so <laughs> depressed and then you go to a play in the room and say, wow, well, it was not so bad. Actually. <laughs> yeah. That's also an option. Yeah, yes. that's interesting. So one thing you already mentioned, like uh, the nerves. So on Instagram and also on, on Facebook, and especially on Instagram, a lot of people posted questions about, um, well, Let's say if principal trumpet in the major symphony orchestra like ours, like Concertgebouw Orchestra, it's one of the positions in the orchestra that that the player has to play solos like almost every concert, no? And um, especially in the brass section, of course, it's first trumpet and first horn doing most of the solos, no? And um, yeah, how do you structure your daily life or weekly life or monthly life or season in order to mentally also be ready for for big programs coming up uh, and i mean can you even speak of small and big programs since most mostly every every week you have something important to play no and if and if you don't have anything important to play you mostly are the let's say the leader of the brass section no like the one that 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 kind of drives the the brass section so how do you, how do you mentally prepare that and 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 um like is there a difference per day or per week do you do long term planning like I try, well, yes, and this is a, also a nice question because I'm quite a nervous person and uh, I had to really change a lot of things um, between the job I was doing in Rome and in Santa Cecilia and when I moved to Amsterdam. Uh, I don't know, probably this expectation also I had in m myself and of course the exposure you have uh, being in such an orchestra here. Uh, really made me uh, very, very nervous, very stressed. So the first year I, I had difficulties of managing, you know, and I was practicing like crazy, man, really the old day, the old day. Uh, and now I have to say I'm still nervous, but um, you, you get, you get, you know better how to manage the nervousness. I mean, I think everyone are nervous, you know, and uh, I probably, I, I don't know people that, uh, you know, that they get less nervous. I just think that you know, you learn how to manage it better. And uh, what I do is um, I really try to practice, to have the good time of practicing, so to prepare the repertoire very well. I really li I listen what is uh, the what I'm going to play. So I want I, it's very important for me to know what the others are playing because then this distracts me a bit and it, uh, from my own uh, playing, you know, from from the trumpet playing. But it really helped me to to be uh, into the music. So and if you go into the music, if you're really focused and concentrate into the music, you can a bit get distracted about this all the, the technical issues that you can have into big pieces or something. And is and that what I, sorry? No, no, no. I was just thinking, is that also something like 
of course, when you practice at home, like when we practice at home, we are very focused on our own part, no? But then at home, while you're practicing, you also imagine all the others, or does is that doesn't that really come until you actually sit down in the first rehearsal? Because, like like you say, I also find it like if you focus on ensemble playing, playing together with people, just making connection to the through the music. Of course, you are, you have less space in your mind to think about other things that actually might make it more difficult, right? But how do you do that switching from um, uh, practicing in your in your uh, practice room alone to to the orchestra already do you make the mental switch at home i do i do actually i f i think that i'm playing together with my colleagues because you know mostly the stress that i get it comes from it doesn't i mean it doesn't come from my caller but it comes i because i'm always worried about what my colleagues and my friend can think about from the trombones friend. you mean <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> no, it's mostly that you know you're when you are surrounded uh, with so many good players, so many great musicians that they man they play so good all the times, and you are just worried to uh, keep up the level. You know you don't want to be the loser of the evening. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I always think uh, to play to be into this um, set into this situation. You know. And uh, but for example, it's, it's a bit awkward, but it's strange. But I also practice like the how to give a text when I'm alone. So I really uh, try to think that I'm leading say, also when I'm practicing alone, you know, and also what can help this if, well, if I do this in this moment, if you can help my colleague. But that's why it's important to know what the others are playing. Because if you don't know what is what is what is what is going on around you, then you are just focused in your playing. But then that can be can be a problem when you go and when you when you because you can get distracted or you can something can surprise you when it's the moment, you know, that's finally your, your theme or your phrase or your sure. message. Well, it, it connects a little bit also to what I spoke about with Katie last week. It's like visualization of the situation before but it's it's very interesting that you connect it actually with the actual practicing. So it's not only the visualization of your own part, but of the of of the whole orchestra or your section or or everybody that's that's playing at the same time, even until details like giving entrances or breathing together or something. That's uh, that's that's interesting. So also what you said um, in terms of um, uh, always being nervous. I mean, I also find that I think every player it's is normal to have a bit of nerves. I mean, nerves, let's say tension, you know, ec or excitement that if you cannot control it well, it can work against you on the moment you have to do it. No? And I, I also found that and th that's what I want to ask you, like, of course, uh, we we both played in different orchestras of different levels and obviously now in the, in the one at the highest level and um, do you also find that it gets easier at one point to play because you're surrounded with good people, but the 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 stress doesn't. I mean, the stress, the the, the nerves don't change. It's only you have to be able just to do the job on the moment you have to, right? So it it can happen that you have to play a big solo and there is a camera in front of your face, and it's like, okay, play Petruska now or play whatever now. So what I found moving into this orchestra with, of course, three, four concerts a week and like the live streams and like uh, TV uh, cameras on your on your on your face when you play a solo is that you have to get used to do your job on the moment that it's needed, like on the moment that you have to do it. So can you explain a little bit more on how you made that? switch mentally and and what you faced or what you went through or what you found that actually works works really well uh for me uh i try to i try to really be, be ready uh preparing very good what i have to do so to to prepare the program very well to do to, to start uh quite long time before if I have big problems uh, big programs coming so I start two three weeks in advance like at least two three weeks in advance 
and I, I just repeat things, you know. I'm this kind of people that repeats and repeats and repeats. <laughs> And, you know, and I do for 10 times, and if the nine times it doesn't come, then I do for 10 times again, until 10 times it's going to be there, you know. And um, for the rest, I think that uh, about the, um, the, the stress is also about the insecurity and the expectation, no? And, uh, of course, if you, if you play with a, a fantastic musician around you, you you also wants to you are also looking for more uh, finesse and for more details, so somehow you are never happy in in a way of what you are doing. You know? that's also why you're you're always asking yourself to improve, 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 improve. So you're studying, and your daily routine is also changing constantly. You no, know? but this is also the nice part of being you know doing this job. You know that somehow you never get. Uh, bored because there is always something to discover and uh, yeah about doing the, the, the to be ready in the moment this is this is also a mental st uh, state of mind you know you just you have to practice that also so you have to really focus you have to uh, listen them you have to know the music sing the music in your head when you are alone and uh, and recreate this kind of tension this kind of nervousness that you could have on stage when you are at home and try to uh, improve uh, the quality also when you are stressed at home you know that's what I always tell also to my students how to prepare an audition I think that uh, one of the aspects that uh, uh, we don't consider so much but that's what also why many people fail in audition is that they practice very 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 good uh, the the technical aspect so the everything they know they know everything very very good but they never think about to be ready uh, mentally for for that moment you know so it was very good i also listened katie the um, the interview of last week i also do uh, i also recreate this kind of situation before so uh, biking there or doing the steps or going walking in and imagine that you have a uh, or a, or a black uh, black screen in front of you or uh, or to, to have a commission in front of you so all these things I, I also do that i also do and i also do with a concert when i have to do some concerts i'm still here <laughs> yeah i was wondering if you're alive <laughs> i am I, <laughs> no i was listening <laughs> and at the same time checking all the comments that people post maybe like a little bit later we will move to that so okay. Just a little bit more in details in terms of exercises. Um, um, wh like, what do you do? You build up your daily routine uh, in certain segments, or like you said, like you used to now start last week with mouthpiece, but you changed it. Like, do you start with long tones? Do you start with singing? Flexibility, articulation. Yes, and I do. I'm the only book I'm doing this because it's this is what I was doing. That's why I was looking always down. I was trying to find it. Sorry. And the, the book I'm doing these days, since uh, we are in uh, quarantine uh, modus, so we cannot have, we don't have concerts. Is this one? So it's this uh, Davidson, you know. A bit more to the middle. Yeah. It's a Davidson. So Louis Davidson trumpet technique. And uh, Lu Louis, Louis Davidson trumpet technique, it's called. Yeah, trumpet technique, Louis Davidson. Okay. And uh, I got this book uh, when I was seven years old from my teacher, from my first teacher. And uh, I find it the copies because at <laughs> the time I had a few, few pages copied from my teacher. And now I finally bought it. <laughs> Should be. <laughs> And uh, but I didn't. I only had the copy, so I never knew what kind of book it was. What kind of who who wrote this book? So I spoke to him a few days ago because he was at home. Yeah. And I said, please, please search for this book and let me know what it is because I want to buy. And I'm, I'm actually doing this. Page. I found it fantastic. And and he was at home, of course, in Italy, so he had time to look for it, and he finally found it. And now I, I know that is the Davidson, but I, I did for the all my life this book without knowing what it was. And and what's the re particular reason you like it? Like certain exercises or? 
because it can be very easy it can be it can be a book for anybody you can it can be the first pages can be very easy you can play easy and slow but you can also make it fast and uh, super virtuosistic book you can go in the very high register you cover uh, all the articulation you cover the very short articulation you cover the long articulation you cover vibrato you cover all the kind of dynamics you cover the legato all kind of, you, you there is a really 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 beautiful book and you can if you don't feel very good one day you can just do the easiest thing so you can stop in the, in the beginning of the book if you feel better or something you can just you know and also for every level of players i think it's really you know worth it to 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 have a look because it can be for uh, uh, beginners but mm-hmm. you can also be like for me i still find it very tricky to do many of these things and in terms i mean you mentioned uh slow and and easy exercises like I noticed it with myself that lately, maybe the last two years, I actually value much more practicing slow in a way. And I see that also often with students, like it's it's very tempting to always look for the shortcut in order to improve, you know. But yeah. unfortunately, you always come back <laughs> to the long road, you know. So, so how do you value slow and easy practice and also uh, like daily routines in 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 order to maintain a shape or to improve something or like when you practice something technically very demanding how would you build that up slow or would you directly start in tempo or yeah, something technically very demanding i just change the piece because it's not the piece <laughs> for me <laughs> come on you can play everything no no but uh, i i'm a big i'm a big lover of long tones and uh, no, I, I really like to to take care of the quality of the sound. You know, the more more the it's always has been something I enjoyed very much. It was more about and you can also hear with my fingering sometimes I'm struggling because I, I actually never really practice my fast fingering because I always enjoyed very much uh, playing and listening the sound and stuff. But if I have to prepare something, I always trying to you know we call this a, a creative creative practicing so. If I have something that it doesn't work, I have a passage that is tricky. I try to create many exercises around it. Uh, so make it mostly if something is very technical and very fast, I always try to find the key moments, the key point or key notes. And around of those notes, I try to uh, make a slow exercise. And mostly I play mostly legato, especially when, I have, when there are big jumps. Uh, I try to reduce the jumps. If we, for example, if we have a jump of one octave or two octaves, I try to make some harmonics in the middle. So to make it as uh, easier as possible. And of course, slowly get close to the uh, result that you want to obtain. So, so basically you, you kind of design a routine in order to improve what what uh, what you are practicing or like um, to to get to the goal you have in mind. Absolutely. For That's example, there is this Petrushka passage, you know. Actually, I have it. Huh? <laughs> oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, cool. oh, let's show it after. <laughs> but, but just to... And, you know, I can... What I practice, how I practice this, um, this exercise, for example, is like that, you know. Just, just one, one question in between yeah. that probably yeah. connects to your story. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned legato practicing. Yeah. So I I found that interesting because on trombone I do that a lot. Like yeah. I practice everything legato first. Of course, we also have the slide, which makes it even like it's it's even difficult to play legato, right? Yeah. But but um, and then add in the articulation. So you're saying you actually do the same on on trumpets and and. Do you also find then that practicing legato first really like sets your air, let's say, air stream and everything? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I al- always uh, start my practicing uh, from the legato. Yeah. Anything, anything I have to play, anything. It can That's be nice. very short, can be, you know, anything. I always try to find this you know, this very, very easy, very simple uh, playing in the same line with a very, very, very 
and stable airflow. That's, that's what nice. I I think it's a very important lesson for, for everybody listening, but for every every student to, to always base it on the sound, the singing, the air, and then add in, you know, uh, like the, the, the articulation and the tonguing that, and everything that makes it more difficult, <laughs> actually. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. great. That's nice. Sorry, like you, you wanted to play like some example of the Petruska? No, but like, yes, just uh, did, for example, to, to, to say what, uh, what kind of exercise I can do with Petruska. No, no I didn't play one more, but... This is the exercise how I make the, this passage simple, you know. So this is how I make it, hopefully without kick. That's <laughs> right now. But this is something that, you know, how you can think about a musical line, you know, you have this. you play and this is probably a very good example to explain how I practice so I just practice legato and I try to find this easy musical line and then after I just think about that I base everything on that you know so, so your your training your ear your your solfege let's say your intonation both in your head and on your embouchure before making like f like making it too difficult with with the articulation let's say so always based on on this kind of concept absolutely that's nice so as you know i always like record movies and everything in the rehearsals <laughs> so I, uh, let me see i have it here ready so from when was this again the petruska uh, we did a tour, I think, two years ago, I think. We yeah. went to Berlin also. And With Ivan Fischer, right? Ivan, yeah. Nice. And just for me, like, of course, I often sit behind you or next to you. I always find it amazing that you... But, I mean, it also connects to what you just explained in the way you prepare it. Like, for me, you always play as good on the first rehearsal as on the last concert. You know, like, the quality is just always there. And that's... I find it always amazing and well you explained it very well before but I think this was even the first rehearsal or something like so this is from my telephone from behind you let's see if we can play it <laughs> that you show me now i know that i have to correct my posture <laughs> <laughs> well that was that was the next question <laughs> actually yes <laughs> exactly how you should not do the, you know, like this. Yeah. well but yeah but i mean it still sounds amazing and nice to hear the acoustics of the whole no i mean like as you as we saw in the um, in the video people also ask always like why do you have this big curtain in the hall you know but that's that's a little bit to imitate as if there is audience in the hall otherwise it's like too boomy you know yeah but bravo yeah i remember those concerts we did them in berlin and in some yeah. other cities no yes yeah, yeah that was nice <laughs> that was very nice so talking about posture <laughs> what you didn't like about yourself I'm not the best person to talk, as you could <laughs> see from the video about posture. Hey, Enzo <laughs> says... like this, you know. Enzo says hello to the Chani. Enzo. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Say hi. Hello from Amsterdam. Hope you're doing fine over there. Yeah, absolutely. No, like, uh, like I got many questions about, about uh, posture. Uh, you know, 
the poster, I mean, what an hour I was, depends also, when I'm stressed, I always bend a bit, you know, so with my neck and stuff, but what I try to be with a posture is just to not, don't have tensed parts in my body, you know, so I try to be, of course, to don't sit with my back attached to the chair, but just to be a bit distant and to, to be very stable with my feet in the ground, even I'm sitting, you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I mean, as you could see from the video, this you can see very well that when I start, when I have, I have to start the solo, I move in front of a chair. So I I mostly do that, and uh, I also practice at home like this. So I move in front of the chair, and I really try to be very straight, you know, like this. Yeah. So this is my back. This one is my back, and this, those are my legs, and those are my feet, you know. So to be very straight. And now I'm for, I was a bit like this now, but hopefully we can try to be like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you cannot always be straight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, so like what well, like the detail I picked out of what you said is like to have as less as possible let's say tension. Uh, unnecessary tension in your body, no? Absolutely. Because any tension is going to influence the sound, obviously. Absolutely, and the tension is also not helping you to to create this, you know, round and uh, and uh, mild and warm sound, you know, because yeah, I always try like to 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 think about power, you know, instead of uh, um, about energy instead of power. I'm sorry, you know, it's like you create energy instead of put force and power, you know. And uh, this is also the image I always think about sound in general. No? When you, you want to produce a big and nice sound stuff, it's always like start from very small, uh, with a lot of quality, and then this becomes kind of an energy. It's like a light color or something magnetic that is spans in the air instead of something very powerful like a, a shoot or you know a hum or something. You know, it's, that's that's always the image. I try to have it. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, let's go to some questions that people ask. Yeah. Somebody asked, um, what is the greatest technical challenge that you had been faced with in your career as a musician? Oh, the greatest technical challenge was to try to to keep up with my biggest friends, which was Giuliano Someralda and, uh, and Miroslav Petkov. You know, every time I listen to those, those people playing and uh, always uh, wants to go home and, and or stop to play or <laughs> go and practice for days. And, you know, that's my what I try. I try to do since I'm a kid, since I met Giuliano, is just to be as close as possible on what he's doing, you know. <laughs> I think he's watching, by the way, and Miro as well. <laughs> uh, say, yeah, hi, guys. And also Miro, you know, since he came here, I'm just... All these people challenge me, you know, that's what something probably I did very well in my life, in my career. I always let people ne next to me um, challenge myself. And also I always try to find something good in the, my colleagues and the people who were around me. And I always try to capture and to to improve and to learn myself what I thought the, the quality that I really loved and appreciated from all of them. So that's that's what is my my biggest challenge actually technically is just to to be able to do what I really like from other people. Giuliano says he has the same feeling from him to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, it reminds me talking about you guys and of course Jaco that also played in the in the ensemble the the three of you the four of you together. Yeah. Good memories from the last brass ensemble tour that we did no in November. We played in Tokyo, Seoul, Kaohsiung, in this amazing hall in Taiwan. In Taiwan. And uh, ah, Bangkok. Yeah. For the first time in history. Absolutely. That was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah, actually, yeah. I got quite some messages, especially on Instagram, of people from uh, Thailand asking when we are coming back. <laughs> oh, we hope we hope we come back soon. Yeah. No, that was. That was a great experience. That was that was nice. And I mean, just referencing to what you just said you, the the your friends our friends you know amazing trumpet players and we are lucky enough to have all of you in the brass ensemble thank you yeah. <laughs>
And Takashi said it's all in the magazine uh, Pipers, the Japanese magazine. Yes, that's true. You did an interview it together, was, no? It was a fantastic day, man. We we laughed like man. It was really amazing that you know. That's great. It's, uh, it's in Japanese, man. Takashi should translate it in English, you know, because he spent days translated in Japanese. And all you should just find a file of this interview, man. It's one of the most funny thing we did, you know. <laughs> it was really, really, really nice. Come back to Thailand, please. I hope we will. Many people from Thailand are watching. Nice. So um, another question that I saw, of course, like before coming to Amsterdam, before coming to the Concertgebouw Orchestra, you already were used to play with a great instrument. Uh, sorry, uh, instrument also, but <laughs> with with a great uh, orchestra and with with great conductors. Yeah. But if you look back, you said you came here in 2003. Uh, 13. 13, sorry, 2013, so seven years, almost eight. Yeah. What would you say in terms of sound or playing or or mentally or just any aspect? What, what would you say changed the most in the last seven years? And do you think it's just a natural progression or does it have to do with doing much more touring, maybe more solo playing, um, maybe different hall or different culture, different people? Like, what what would you say? Like, okay, this this changed me the most uh, positively. Well, it's a combination of facts, you know, and the and the situation. Of course, being being in another country, uh, talking another language, uh, this also changed a lot. Uh, Somehow, yeah, the, the focus also and the way of thinking and it being, being able to communicate with uh, uh, many people from abroad, from many other countries. And uh, that's also something that uh, enriches you, of course, you know, enriches you. And uh, mostly I, I think that what, what made me um, grow a lot is just to have the possibility to play every day with the best of the best musicians that are in the planet, you know. You know, even get, you get inspired from everyone here, you know, from you guys behind playing so beautifully, from the, the oboe player, you know, that they do this amazing phrase, from the flute that does this fantastic legato, from Karen, you know, it's for everyone, from everyone. And you just want to uh, find uh, and be able to deliver as much quality as possible. That's why you uh, also my practicing change uh, in a way also a lot because I'm more focused in details. So I spend much more time in the basics actually than probably I was doing also even before. I, w I always did a lot of basics, but now I think I do more and more. And basics, I mean also uh, all kind of articulation, uh, really be able to control all the kind of dynamics, being able to control the different vibratos. You know, these for me are all, that for me are part of basics, you know. And then before I was, when I was, uh, before I came to Amsterdam, I was also uh, focusing and looking a lot into big repertoire which I still do it now. I'm still looking for uh, for some to, to improve, of course, my repertoire and to know new concert, etc., etc., etc. But I try to really uh, look for those kind of details, you know. And then, thanks to these kind of things, like you have many, many colors, you can fit as best as possible with these uh, amazing colleagues, you know, these fantastic uh, musicians that, you, that are around you. Still here, <laughs> yeah. I have exactly the same experience. It's it's true. Like, of course. Like, I mean, there were also many questions. Who is your favorite trumpet player? But but I think it's it's not only about uh, looking at players from your own instrument, no. <laughs> but but how arrogant, how arrogant would be myself? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see you. I see you saying that actually. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, but but you know to be in a top orchestra, you're like you said, you're lucky to be around amazing players with which we, from which you always can take things. And besides that, of course, 
like we are lucky to play with incredible conductors and and soloists no like especially as brass players you can learn so much from singers also or like i remember we did this wagner uh like concertante in in luzern remember yeah and uh, the singer was behind us yeah. a- and the, the, the i think it was a tenor or the bass uh, i think it was a bass but just to hear these people breathe i mean so yes. of course being in in an orchestra like ours we are lucky to 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 be playing with the, like this kind of amazing people no it's i think it's a nice it's a nice lesson to not only focus on your own instrument but broadly listen to many instrumentalists and soloists and singers no that's nice that's that's good another question that i got it's about articulation so um when you practice articulation do you think of certain uh tones or uh vowels or do you connect it to speech or more to sound or what what's your approach in terms of of articulation i connect it very much to talking you know and um It's a it's a good topic, but it's a very very uh, long topic actually. But m- to make it very simple, I um, I really connect it to talking, you know. So if I have to do, for example, we can always take this Petrushka as an example. It's very simple, no? So and if you sing it like this. You would you would, you would want to recreate the same kind of quality, same kind same kind of sound when you're playing, and uh, it's different if you play, for example, so you can see that all, even when you sing, even when you when you talk, you can recreate already many different kind of uh, articulations, and. Uh, yeah, then it's also b- a bit dangerous when you start to talk about where the tongue has to be, you know, tongue high, tongue down, tongue low, tongue here, tongue there. You know, I think that in the end, your body, our body knows exactly what he has to do. It's very important for me. The most important thing is that you have a very clear idea of the result that you want to obtain, you know, and then somehow you find a way, you know. If you want to, if you say to, like Thomas on or table, ta, te, to, ti. You know, your tongue goes in the different places, goes in the different spots, but it's not that you think, like now I say, oh, I put the tongue higher. No, you just pronounce, you just talk, you know. And it's the same. And for this, we can relate and we can reconnect again to the singing, you know. If you just sing, if you just sing, then the, your body somehow it will move and it will work in that direction. But and then, of course, there are exercises to do in practicing. Which can be a very good book and be Coprash, both books. It's fantastic. Ah, you also use Coprash? Absolutely. It's ah, me my, too. It's it's like my uh, daily my with all my students as well. Coprash, really amazing. Absolutely. And my Bible, you know. Nice. And uh, like I I use it for exactly the same reason. So, yeah. but I think I think it's very important to repeat what you just said. Like rather than focusing on all of the movements you are making with your tongue it's much better to connect to the speech no because that of course but because that's know, already that, that's already programmed in your body basically you think like now i put my tongue i behind the teeth yeah but for to for what to do what yeah you know if you don't know what you want to attain the kind of result you want to have then it doesn't make sense you're just doing a movement but without having you know like it's very important to know what kind of sound, what kind of articulation, what kind of result you want to get. Sound imagination. Absolutely. Oh, that's nice. That's good. So just once more to the people who are watching. First of all, thank you for watching. Second of all, let us know from where you're watching. And we will be finishing in about 10 minutes. So if you still have any questions, feel free to, to write them down below. But for example, I can I can mention the books I do. So then, then yes. is one of the things I do. So I said before I do this uh, this uh, book in the beginning. No, this Davidson. Uh, yeah. And is it someone uh, asked? Is it Louise Davidson? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's Louise Davidson. 
and then I do uh, um, the coprash. So the, the exercise from Cop, which I find really, really beautiful. Then I do uh, Arban, of course, uh, Clark, of course. Uh, I do, um, I'm doing quite a lot of uh, um, Charlier, which is a fantastic, project. most beautiful music you can find there. And then I, I, <laughs> I used to play that one on the phone, you made some amazing that one. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, very beautiful, very beautiful. And then I do uh, the Bozza, uh, um, 16 etudes from Bozza. Uh, I do um, this is a Solomon uh, book. So some something, but basically what I really uh, always do, also when I'm on tour, like to keep uh, my my myself feeling good, is this Davidson and uh, Coprash, and Arban, of course. These three, these three, three things. Actually. Um I'm 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 reading some questions. I'm, anyway, first to go back to what you just said, I think it's 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 nice to know what 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 you're using, and maybe later I will write it in the um, in the comment section to to sure. what you're exactly using. It's uh it's nice. To, um, so Giuliano, who is watching, and also Miriam, our colleague on uh, English Horn, she she also made a comment about sound imagination, and Giuliano says like maybe Omar can say how he creates his strong image of the result in his imagination. So maybe we can dig a little bit deeper uh, on the uh, the sound imagination. Like, do you always imagine the same sound or also uh, connected to the atmosphere of the music, the emotion of the music, the, the style of the music? Um, also, do you change it in different halls or depending on what instrument you're playing? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Well, there are different ways to think about and to imagine it, your sound. One is to imagine it through colors. So you think about colors. And uh, But what, what, I, um, what I do and what I really try to do is to imagine, and this is always never, uh, I always try to, to think this, is to be actually to put myself in the middle of my sound. So I'm not I'm not thinking so much in the projection, like in, to to project my sound into the whole. But uh, the idea is to really make the whole full of my sound. So I really think a lot to, um, for example, to to expand my sound and to also project my sound in my back, so behind me, and not always in front. This is why. I think the idea and the um, kind of Im 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 imagine yourself being in the middle of this bubble, which the bubble is your sound, is a very powerful and uh, interesting idea. And of course, uh, as I said, also this bubble or this kind of sound that is surrounding you, it cannot be hard or pushed or aggressive, you know. Otherwise, you you probably get the the other uh, sound, the one that is more going and projecting into the all, you know. So everything is connected to this kind of uh, also way to think uh, the sound instead of power. Think about energy, you know. So or is it like you you throw a stone into a water and then you have this this uh, you know circles that expand slowly, 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 you know. And it's not made from power that, you know, it's made from the energy. So this is always the kind of uh, image that I always try to keep in my mind when I think about in terms of sound. That's nice. And I mean, to go back to the Petruska, since we just had a little excerpt of, of the rehearsal, what kind of energy or color or sound image image did you have in your head when you when you were practicing that or performing that? Well, when I did this, I tried to be uh, to still have kind of uh, a nice and warm sound, but to not be heavy, so to be light, you know. And also, it's nice to think about uh, to have a, a clear image in front of you, like. 
uh, to have this kind of uh, you know dancer or marionette or something which is like which is actually about this piece this passage no so to be like very flexible light and jumping and just to in your mind to just to recreate that feeling you know but, uh, but I think that last one is it's so important also for students I mean also for ourselves to never forget that music is always written with an image in the composer's brain no or or it comes from a thought or like something that they experience probably so it's it's yeah. it's easy to 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 forget that and and be be only busy with with making everything sound in the box absolutely but you and want one, to one, you want to express thing. something no yes absolutely that's true and one more thing about sound that i forgot but is actually probably as important as imagination is really to try to blow warm air. Yeah. It's, I will never stop to get tired to say to everyone, think, in, think really with, to blow uh, warm air. Yeah. So you don't blow really like, but... Yeah. It's like you can be in front of a mirror or in front of a window or something, and you blow this air, and then you get this foggy, you know, this foggy image. That's, that's, that's the how you can probably also get this kind of, you know, so don't think about cold there, but warm, 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 and you know, like the sound is hugging you. And and to, in terms of sound, would you say that the concert about, I mean, the hall itself uh, helps also to to get to this image? Because obviously one of the characteristics characteristics that makes our orchestra known and, f and, and is famous for is the sound, you know? And Absolutely. and the warm sound and, and imagination by by every player possible in 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 the orchestra or like as a section and and um, do you find that um, your thought of sound changed over the last seven years just playing in this orchestra or or especially playing in the hall and of course playing with no. and of course playing with me. <laughs> It changed. I had to. Me I had to fit with you, baby. You know, I, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> I could not play like me when you. Like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so I had to. I had to do something. You know. <laughs> no, actually, listen. Uh, no, my 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 idea of sound uh, it didn't change. It changed. Uh, it changed a bit my way of creating because they are because they all because they are acoustic. Uh, so uh, it's not necessary to do as much work as I was doing before to recreate this kind of sound. But uh, I always loved it and I always uh, liked it so much. But then probably that's why I always liked this all very much. Also, you know, so it matched very much my my idea of sound. So now probably is a bit more easy, easier to to get it into this place. But this the, this kind of image of sound and the rounders, I always uh, had it. Uh, I always liked it since I was a kid. So you would say it actually like became in a way easier to to yeah it changed change the way change the way of doing and uh, you know you can probably change something technical yeah. because they all doesn't require something or whatever or you change equipment or whatever yeah but uh, uh, the the idea the, my personal idea of sound I have to say it's quite it's quite the same of what I, I before, yeah. That's nice. That's great. Let's do two more questions. And uh, for everybody watching, take a screenshot, post it on social media, tag us, so the next time even more people will tune in and know about the the live streams. For sure, we will do it more often. Also with Omar, we have other players of the brass section also joining. We already did two with Katie Woolley, our principal horn, and Perry Hogendijk, our tubist. And the next one will actually be your friend, our friend, our colleague Miro Petkov. Uh, we will do one next week together. And um, well, let us know in the comment section if you have any suggestions. Next time I'm going to interview you. <laughs> you have a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's 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 nice to do and to connect with um with the people. So pl take a screenshot, tag us on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you you want to do it. So two more questions. A question that actually I wanted to avoid, but it was asked so many times. 
how to work. Many people, by the way, are talking about uh, Maria de Buenos Aires recording. Uh, talking yes. about you and Miro playing fantastic. Anyway, let's go back to the to the to the question about high range. Um, your body when you are playing high. Yeah, well, I mean a bit of tension is is a normal thing. Of course, know? not. That's why Possible. I say unnecessary tension. Let's say. But uh, for me, it's very important. I mean, I think that the, the high register actually. Uh, um, start from the low register if you don't have a <laughs> low register then you cannot have a high register you know so i actually it sounds a bit weird but i really work a lot in my low register if i have to play something high so i make sure that uh, uh, the focus and the center in the low register is very good and uh, i don't play so much high notes you know i don't practice so much high notes I'm not uh, a guy that spent hours practicing a very high register. Uh, but uh, if I do, and when I do, I work on the semitone scales. So I always try to start from low, do a semitone scales, two octaves, and then trying to find, uh, trying to keep the same kind of uh, sound, same kind of, uh, as you said, uh, tension in the body, so to don't get too much uh, tense in the body. And then if I, and then I, I, I just add one semitone at a time. So if I don't feel good in what I'm doing, I just go back. I don't go higher, I just go back. And then you work like that until you feel comfortable and you feel confident what you are doing. But as I said before, I think that it's very important, uh, it's very important to realize that without a very a good low register, it's very difficult that you have a, a good high register. So, like also in my um, experience, <coughs> my high register started to come when I improved my overall uh, technique. Like it's it's not just one thing that you that you that you should focus on improving, like high range. Like I found, and I also see it with students. Like when you improve your general technique and your general ability of playing, you also notice that the high register start getting easier, right? And as you said, step by step. Of course. But many times when you have a problem, because everyone focuses in the last note, no, like, ah, oh, this high note didn't come. Yeah, but it didn't come because you didn't blow, you didn't play yeah. the, the five notes before. Yeah, 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 that's nice. You know, the problem is not the last one, but it's actually what is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, you know? That's nice. Uh, let's do a last question. By the way, Jens Lindemann, he says he's very proud of you for representing Concert Gabo in Italy. Also in the movie that you made together. That was an incredible movie with so many Thank you, yes. players. <laughs> it was a great project you made. Yeah, sounds amazing. And um, he has actually a nice question that also other people asked before and that I was also wondering myself. Like, of course, you also... Um, do a lot of solo playing and obviously in your uh, quintet, no, Wonder Brass Quintet, Italian Wonder Brass, together with Giuliana also. And of course, like the last couple of years, we do a lot with, um, with the brass ensemble uh, of, the, of the orchestra, mostly in a, in a tented form. Um, of course, it's, very, it's a very busy life as a professional musician beside the orchestra job, no? But yeah. how would you find that that doing all of those extra things, so the quintet, the solo playing, the teaching, the master classes, and the brass ensemble, even though sometimes it makes a full agenda and there's a lot of preparation and playing, how how does it benefit your orchestra career and your orchestra playing? Let's say. Well, it, and, it and doesn't. Would you recommend it to 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 people? I do recommend if you feel good to do it. Yeah. If you don't feel well. If you really then then don't do it, but of course I mean, uh, for me it's very important to to play with a quintet first of all because I have a, a great time with friends and yeah. also with a brass player. That's that's for me the most important thing to spend time with friends and to enjoy doing life and to just decide how you want to do. So to don't depend on someone telling you or you know just you just be free to make your own music and doing it. That's also why the solo is also important or the chamber music thing, anything is great, you know, just to express yourself and to find your own way. So to don't depend on 
different uh, uh, um, people or the conductor telling you this, or you have to feel like that, you know, just to be free and to find this freedom to finally go for it and to express yourself. And the second aspect is, of course, the fact that a uh, different way of playing, different situation, different uh, repertoire, different settings, you know, uh, require different uh, technical aspects. So yeah. it's a way to improve yourself constantly, constantly, because playing French music as a solo is not the same as playing a Brick symphony, Bruckner symphony, you know, or playing with a brass quintet require a different kind of... Uh, uh, power and uh, flexibility that uh, it's completely different than probably do a tour with Mahler 5, you know. Uh, so you have to learn, you learn and you experiment and you improve and you sometimes you fail, but this is also a way to improve, you know. And uh, I think it's very important for all musicians to do that, you know, if you want to, yeah, to get better every day and to just keep, also to keep up, you know, to keep up always. So to keep challenging yourself and and what I, I found the first point you 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 brought up uh, also important not only because you see it as doing work but in a way also fun and as a kind of relaxation because you play with people that you that you love to play with and just have a good time with even besides the trumpet no. Yeah, I mean, the tour we did with Brass was just a fantastic week. Yeah, that was nice. Friends, Last November. You know, it was amazing, you know. And yeah. That's what is music about, you know, to share great time with the people, you know. I mean, not saying that you cannot have the same feeling in the orchestra, but of course you're oh, part of a bigger absolutely. mass. You know, it's, 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 it's different. So it, the combination it's, it's a good thing, no? So it, it, it certainly... To go to the core of the question, it benefits your orchestral career and playing, let's say. It does enormously in terms of feeling better and also in terms of being, uh, being more confident when I play in the orchestra. Yeah. Because having the exposure to play uh, chamber music or solo is, uh, I mean, uh, it's quite a challenge. So when you go back and you have to do some small solos or something in the orchestra, you feel a bit more confident because you did these big programs before. Uh, and then also because, as I said before, you have to work and you have to find a different, uh, um, you have to work in a different technical aspect, which of course surely uh, makes you improve in your orchestra playing, you know. Nice. Great. I think we have arrived to the, to the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Omar. I think this was Thank very you. useful. I learned a lot and, I, and I'm sure people watching online learn a lot. There are still many, many, many questions that we should answer. But um, I mean, let's do it again, no? Absolutely. At one point. And, uh, Thank you, Martin, for this great project that you are doing. It's, uh, it's you're amazing. welcome. It gives me some motivation in this time of, uh, <laughs> of, of not much going of on, you know. <laughs> Thank you from all of us. It's yeah, no, great. you're welcome, of course. So I will close the... Um, the live stream with some music. Ciao, Omar. See you soon. Huh? Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay healthy, guys. <laughs> so just to finish it, um, like Omar said, we play many times together, uh, also with the brass ensemble. And there is a little piece that we always play in the end of every concert. Like, of course, I'm sure you know it. So I will finish the live stream with this. Um, just for your information, um, we will be doing more on our YouTube and uh, Facebook channels live. The next guest will be Miro Petkov, our great friend, Omar and my friend and, and colleague, uh, also principal trumpet in the Concertgebouw Orchest. He will be the guest next week. Um, in the meantime, feel free to share this feed. Uh, your screenshots, etc. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, because we will be doing more in the in the coming time. And um, let's end with some music. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Again, I wish you all the health, also for you and your family. And hope we see each other soon again in the beautiful concert halls around the world.